All right, hello, and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm joined by, uh, I'm joined by Ian Koniak, who is actually just up the road in an equally sunny Los Angeles. How are you doing, Ian? I'm great, man. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. And Ian is one of the strongest B2B sales lead in the world, highly sought after elite sales coach. And you are the founder of Ian Cognac Sales Coaching. So we're going to talk sales today, um, surprisingly great. enough. Yeah. <laughs> and what I thought, what I'd what I thought I'd like to talk to you about, Ian, today is um, you know, there's a lot of people in sales, right? And a lot of people default into the sales job. You know, maybe they come out of college, maybe they do a marketing degree or whatever, and they discover that the the degree they did, there isn't a lot of jobs, so they default into sales. So a lot of people end up in sales, not by choice, but by default. And sometimes sometimes it works out, sometimes they get, they get stuck and maybe not have a very fulfilling career. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is, if you're if you're a salesperson and you're going to be a salesperson for a, a, the foreseeable future, how can you kind of turn that around and make it fulfilling and perhaps even ultimately enjoyable? Well, this this might sound counterintuitive, but stop focusing on hitting your quota um, and start focusing on helping your customers and serving your customers. And for me, that is when I started to perform my best. Is when I stopped making it about just hitting the number. You see, if you're just trying to make it so your whole goal in sales is to hit your number um, and fundamentally uh, you're not making it about contributing or helping others solve a problem or achieve a goal or improve their lives, it's going to suck. It's going to feel like a grind. You're going to get to your number and you're going to be like, great, now I have to start all over again. But when you actually make it about who you're helping um, and you really dig deep to understand their situation and how that challenge or problem that you're solving is impacting their people or their customers or the, the person that you're working with and really show them how through use of your product or service or solution, you know, depending on what you sell, um, is going to make their life better and their company more successful and their users more successful than it actually feels really good. And, and in fact, it drives much larger deals than if you're just focusing on yourself and hitting your number. And I just found that that shift from like inward focus to outward focus makes the job a lot more enjoyable. Yeah, no, it, it, it's interesting. I, I, I agree with you when you sort of get out of your, get out of your own head. And I guess part of that is, is switching to being to being genuinely curious and wanting to understand, you know, who you're dealing with, the issues they have, et cetera. But, but you have to have that genuine level of curiosity. Otherwise you'll never really go on that journey. Will you? Yeah. You, you, I always say, you know, in order to be a great salesperson, you have to be a great person. So what does it mean to be a great <laughs> person? Well, I think it starts with caring. You're not going to be curious. You're not going to really want to understand if, if your whole goal is just to get a sale, you're just going to like, do whatever you can do to get the sale, you know, discount or, you know, really um, just be be a bulldog, which certainly there's a time and a place for that, especially when you know you're helping the customer and mm -hmm. they get out of their own way. It's your job to to see it through. But but really, you know, the 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 ultimate um, you know, salespeople, the best salespeople, the ones that genuinely care about their their clients and you know, they care more about helping their clients achieve their outcomes than they do um, hitting their own outcomes. You know, your own outcomes are a result of helping your clients achieve their outcomes. And once you get that and, and get it, it's not just about closing the deal and walking away and moving on. It's really about helping them achieve their outcomes. Um, the clients can sense that. They can see that and they are going to respond a lot differently. Um, good old Zig Ziglar has a, has a quote, which I um, have always tried to live by, and especially as I've moved into the sales coaching arena, and, and it's it's really simple. He says, help others get what they want and you will get what you want. Or he says, if, if you help enough people get what they want, then you're going to get what you want. And, and, and to me, that really is the essence of, of sales is understanding what people want, what's stopping them from getting it, and then linking back your product or service and showing them how you can actually help them get what they want. And, and, and 
I, I mean it. Once you do that, it feels genuinely good. And, and it's not about you anymore. It's about other people. And you feel like you're actually making an impact versus just, I got the deal. Oh, that was exhausting. Mm. Oh, I got to go take a break or get a drink or, you know, something because uh, that was draining and that sucked the life out of me. It, it's got to be a two way street. You know, it's, it's, I also think when you're dealing with bigger companies, when you're in a less transactional sale, that helps with, with solving mm. bigger problems and, and making a bigger impact. Cause there's a lot, the skill set of selling enterprise deals and selling strategic deals is entirely different than the one who does transactional deals, rinse and mm -hmm. repeat over and over again, which I think anyone who's done that for years is going to burn out simply because you, you stop growing and it's not mentally challenging anymore once you once you master it. So I think depending on what you sell and who you sell to, that can also drive a, a different level of fulfillment versus mm -hmm. selling a transactional commodity product to a lot of different customers that feels the same for every customer. Right. So how do you, so how can you, uh, how would you advise people like to get out of their own way a little, because I feel like sometimes people, says people take on all the negative uh, energies and stereotypes and all of that, and they feel like they're always playing defense, right, because they're fighting against these you know, popular culture and negative stereotypes and maybe people who've had experienced different kinds of behavior. Um, and I feel like a lot of salespeople approach everything from a point of view of playing defense from the off. Yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting question. I mean, the, the stereotype of the used car salesman that's putting hard pressure on people to buy something they don't want or need is still very real, but that's not what sales is. In fact, mm -hmm. Um, it's not even close to what what sales is. Is you know when I look at sales, and and I came from a company called Salesforce.com, and I was in their enterprise division. My role was an account director, and my job specifically was to work with the Fortune 500 companies. I only had two accounts when I left in my final year, um, and I had a team of 20 people, and I was quarterbacking all of the resources that Salesforce had, you know, from companies that we had acquired to engineering resources, to business value resources, to third-party consultants, and connecting them with the customer and, and specifically in, in their C-suite to really align and solve the biggest problems that the customer have. And that, that feels a lot more like management consulting or what someone would sell who works for an Accenture or Deloitte, mm -hmm. where they're really hired to solve the biggest problems and challenges to help companies digitally transform. That's what I was doing. And I would bring in big teams. And, you know, when I had meetings, sometimes it would be 15 or 20 VPs. And that's not anything like the stereotype. And, mm -hmm. and that is what the upper echelon of, of sales professionals are, are doing. And when you do that well, you can make a million dollars a year. And I, I don't know many doctors or lawyers or accountants or a lot of industry professionals that are able to have that type of opportunity. So anyone who's, you know, taking all the negative stereotypes, like you're, you're just like, you know, you've got to focus on what you can control and, and what you can control is showing up every day and doing your best and really paying your dues wherever you are in your career, paying your dues and, and looking at, at how can I be the best in the role I'm in right now. And as you take that approach one day, one week, one month, one year at a time, um, you'll see yourself getting promoted to bigger and better opportunities within your company. Or maybe if your company is in one of those positions where it feels like a commodity, it doesn't feel like you're really helping the customer solve some strategic problems, maybe you can go into a different type of company that is. So sales really, again, those stereotypes, I, I, I consider myself more of a consultant than a peer to right. uh, executives than I, than I do a salesperson. So I, I think that's just, you know, um, not accurate. Yeah. And no, I like what you said there about being a peer, because I think that's that's um, key to a lot of it is where is where salespeople have the confidence in their own abilities and what they bring to the table and their problem solving, et cetera. So you can have a peer to peer conversation because let's face it. Why would I bring you in if I could solve all the problems myself? That's right. And you don't need to be an expert on their business. A lot of people that get really confused and they say, well, what am I going to add to a chief revenue officer, a chief marketing officer, a CEO? What do they want to learn from me? And, and the reality is you don't need to know everything about their business. You need to know and be an expert on the problems you solve that are common in the industries and the roles and the personas that you that you serve. And so if you can speak to the challenges that you solve and why they exist and the root causes of those challenges, um, and then get them to either admit or confirm that they also are struggling with similar challenges, then they become very interested in learning how you can help with that. Because 
again, you don't need to be an expert in all things, but you need to be an expert in the problems you solve and the outcomes that you help your customers um, receive. And if you can speak to that very well and, and be good at having a conversation with clients to get them to open up and really um, share kind of where they're struggling. And, you know, if it's in areas that you can help with, great. And if it's not, and that's not a priority, then, hey, walk away. There's plenty of other cats who will be happy to talk to you. And I think I think that's also really important in making it fun is like not feeling like it's this pressure thing where you're pushing people to do something. Like you want to be engaging with people that, fundamentally actually want and need your help and are willing to, you know, um, be, be transparent with you about their challenges mm -hmm. and their costs and just some of their goals. Because if you don't have that, it, it's crappy. Why would you want to pull teeth? I'll call right. people out and tell people like, why aren't you sharing? I'm here to help you. Like we're not here to play games. <laughs> I think customers, that's how you become a peer, you know, when, when, they, yeah. when you call them out, when you challenge them. And, and, and when you say, look, no need to, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Like I'm not, here to hard close you. I'm not here to tell you anything that you should be doing, but I can tell you that this is an area we can help with. And, you know, if it's something that you're struggling with, here's the path forward that, that we can take together, but it's going to require commitment on your side and on our side. So I'm only going to work with people that actually want and need my help. So a lot of times, like you just got to have some self-respect where you're not desperate. You're not chasing people that frankly are not good fits for what you sell. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point. And one other thing that you mentioned earlier, I just wanted to come back to is uh, about how you show up, because clearly, we know that is one thing you have complete control over. Nobody, nobody has control over the way you show up. So back when you kind of made the switch and, and, and it started to all make sense to you and you went on this phenomenal career that you're still on, um, what was it about how you showed up that you changed? Not being attached to outcomes not being mm -hmm. desperate, not feeling like you got to get every deal and hard closing. And like, that feels icky. That feels mm -hmm. cool. That's energy draining, right? So I, when I stopped like caring, and, and I know that sounds, again, everything that you need to be successful is the opposite of what you've been taught or the opposite of what you might think. But when you genuinely stop caring and stop being so attached to the outcomes, like you're not going to, ride the highest highs and the lowest lows anymore. You're going to show up. You're going to focus on what you can do, which is work hard and, you know, do your, do your revenue generating activities, your RGAs every day. And, you know, everything else is up to the deal gods. Every, you know, it's like, it, it, it really is a matter of like, just being direct with people. You know, if I could say when I really made a switch, I think it was all about like getting the deal and closing the deal and clients could smell that. But when I just said, Look, I'm not going to make the outcome of the, the sale, whether or not I, I get the deal. The outcome is, you know, am I engaging with the right decision makers? Do I have champions? Do I have people that want to work with me? Am I at the right level? Am I working with the right types of companies? And I really started focusing on fewer companies, but very targeted, very, very um, well-qualified companies. And I, I did a lot bigger deals because I was focusing in that, you know, above the above the power line. And when I started meeting with the executives and I started really engaging with, you know, the power line, I realized like people, I actually did a lot better with, with executives because generally they're pretty direct and, and they're casual. Like you and I are talking now we're you know, we're dressed mm -hmm. casually and that's kind of the way executives are. It's just like, you know, when I stopped pitching and trying to like pitch and talk and pitch and actually shut up and started listening and getting curious and asking questions and really trying to understand like, is this person have the, the, the right um, challenges or priorities that I can help with? And if, if so, what are the questions I can ask? And I, I think the last thing I did is I, I really started to, um, I know it sounds weird, but I started to like, uh, I started to prepare a lot more in, in, in ways that I had never done before. So I would try to find common ground with people in a way like that. I can just like take off the sales hat and just put on the human hat. So looking at people's backgrounds, watching if they've been on a podcast or done a, done a speech or something, watching that in advance and like calling out some things that I really liked and complimenting people and trying to be like a really nice person rather than that, you know, stereotypical salesperson who shows up and throws up. So when I started like caring about the person I was meeting with and doing my research and showing them that I actually um, came in with a thoughtful um, idea of who they were and, and what they were focused on and also put together a point of view on how I could help, 
everything changed in how I was received in that meeting. I stood out from a lot of the other salespeople. And that's, that's the stuff I teach people to do in my, my coaching programs. But um, preparation really does make a, a big difference in terms of your confidence. And in the final thing I, I did that was different is I started just listening a lot more mm -hmm. and thinking a lot deeper. Uh, Stephen Covey, the author of uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which is one of my favorite books, um, he has a quote. It says, most people listen with the intent of replying rather than understanding. And so if someone says a, they have a problem, a lot of sales reps say, well, great, I have a solution. Here's my demo. <laughs> Whereas if someone says I, I, they have a problem, now what I do is, well, tell me more about the problem. Why is it a problem? How long has it gone on for? What's the impact of that problem? Have you ever tried to solve it? Um, why is it important to solve it right now? What are you planning to do to solve it? Hey, if you don't solve it, you know what's going to happen? What does that mean for you and your business? Mm -hmm. so now I ask seven questions in a conversation manner on one specific problem and dug really deep. And now I have all the ammunition I need to go back to the customer and remind them why they need to do a deal because of the implication of the problem. Mm -hmm. This stuff isn't necessarily new, but I think it's, it's really, really powerful when mm -hmm. you just good at listening and digging deep and trying to like ask those follow-up questions and being fully present with the person you're talking to. So you can um, know what to ask and kind of pick up on those cues. So I did that a lot more as I, I'd say I dug a lot deeper, yeah. to really get to the truth. Yeah. But I mean, we used to say back in my own health white days is like prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's what a lot of people do. So you prescribe yeah. a solution without diagnosing the problem. But one of the one of the interesting things um, you know you said there is is ha you know having that conversation and really going deep with it, and that that does require you to learn how to listen and really listen and validate what the people are saying. And that, I mean, you're talking about counterculture. That's pretty counterculture today because nobody wants to listen. Everybody wants to talk and everybody wants instantaneous. So the, the focus to do preparation and then to really do exploration and listening, I mean, those are, those are real skills that can totally set you apart today, which is crazy that it should, but they can. I agree. I mean, and again, you, you, you talk about fulfillment in the beginning, what makes a rep fulfilled? What makes a rep fulfilled is actually doing more listening and, and getting the client. It's, it's very rewarding and it's very enriching when you have a client open up with you and share their challenges and their fears and their frustrations and their goals. I mean, it just feels good to like know that the person that you're working with truly has, has some major areas that they're trying to solve for and to know that you can help them do that. It's, it's very enriching. And if you, like you said, if you just jump to the pitch, it's like, it's like you're a robot. Anyone can do that. You know, they can go online and do that. So I think those skills are honestly like developed over time. It's not something you just, I mean, I can teach you how to listen and be, a, you know, mm -hmm. uh, prepare more, but it, it's not natural for salespeople. I think people in sales, when they start, usually they're selling like a high volume, they're selling the smaller businesses or maybe commodity or something. And it's like, they're used to this, like memorize a script, go fast and, you know, hit up as many people as possible. It's a numbers game. And the way I'm describing is, is not that way. It's actually slow yes. down, be more patient, find the right people, dig deep. And, and those skills are something that um, if we think about, you know, patience or we think about focus, if we think about research, if we think about just like they're boring. Like you get a lot of dopamine when you're going fast, when you're talking and doing all this stuff, you're like on a high and, and this stuff doesn't necessarily give you that, that ultimate high, but it, it does make you a lot more successful. So later on, you're actually going to get a much bigger <laughs> high than when you did your great pitch, you know? So I think, I think it's just, I don't know. I think salespeople are wired to want that like immediate gratification. And I see that. I know that was my story for a while, but like when I, mm -hmm when I, I was selling more deals and getting more closing and more dopamine than anyone, but I missed my number. Um, <laughs> and that's when I made all these changes to go and become number one at Salesforce and in, in the mm -hmm. enterprise. And, and frankly, um, it, it, it's, it's something that I think most people, most salespeople, there's a stereotype of the salesperson who shows up and throws up and mm -hmm. taps their head off and doesn't listen. That exists for a reason, right? And, and it's because a lot of salespeople, that's that's how they engage with their clients. And I can just tell you firsthand from my own career and from people that I've coached and helped that fundamentally that that's not the way to go. That's going to be scraping and clawing to maybe get to your number or maybe not. But 
really the more you you actually slow down in sales and be focused and plan and research and actually um, take time to come up with a very tailored message and put together a thoughtful point of view, that that's actually going to land you bigger meetings with better customers and and a higher level. And, and that is what's going to lead to a lot bigger deals. So you don't have to mm-hmm. scrape and claw with small deals. You can do a few very large deals every year and blow it out of the water versus these, you know, very transactional kind of rinse and repeat salespeople that, you know, what, what you started with in sales is not going to get you to the mm-hmm. highest level of strategic selling. That That is for sure. So I could see why it mm-hmm. happens, but it doesn't, it, it, it's not fulfilling. It's, it feels crappy to, to sell that way. Yeah, and it's interesting, uh, Ian, that there's a lot of research recently and it's shown not just on customers, but on people in general. And some of the things that people treasure most, and and especially after the pandemic, is they want to be seen and acknowledged and heard. It's quite simple. They want you to see them as somebody. They want to acknowledge who they are and they and they actually want to be heard. Everything that you've been talking about there is exactly what what people are craving today. Yeah. If you can literally leave your ego at the door and salespeople have big egos and they're full of like, you know, just her host. Mm-hmm. I don't know what the word is, but like, just like, look at me. I'm, um, you know, I, I was this guy. I literally had a Maserati, very flashy, you know, very like focused on just, um, you know, recognition and money. Mm-hmm. And I'm telling you, I, I had addiction struggles and I, you know, whenever there's ego involved, there's going to be bad behavior involved. There's going to be a lack of fulfillment. And, and in my experience, when I shifted and left my ego at the door and actually became humble and, and just genuinely wanted to like help people and serve and like wasn't attached to those outcomes of having to close the deal, my numbers were through the roof. They really were. And, and mm-hmm. in my business, my coaching business has done over seven figures in its first year. And it's because I'm approaching it the same way with genuine desire to help and serve my clients and, you know, really just, just make it about them. You almost need to be like an empty vessel, your ego and your agenda needs to disappear when you can show up that way to your clients. I mean, I'm telling you, everything changes and the way you're received is going to change because it's all about them. It's not about you. It's that inward to outward shift that every salesperson must make to elevate our industry and frankly, to elevate your, your income. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it. Elevate your industry, elevate your income, elevate your own sense of self as well at the same time, which is always good. Hey, um, listen, Ian, this has been fantastic. All of Ian's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your the work you do. Well, if you um, want sales coaching or you feel like you need an extra boost or some ca- accountability or you just don't know what to do, um, I do have a sales coaching platform. It's all sold out for the year, but I will take clients in December. So the way to get there is, is visit the website, untapyoursalespotential.com. And when you go on there, um, you, you can sign up for the wait list and then I'll reach out when spots open. Again, that's untapyoursalespotential.com. That's my coaching program. And if you just want to get free sales advice or videos or trainings, I do have my YouTube channel. That's uh, Ian Koniak on YouTube, youtube.com slash Ian Koniak. And uh, on LinkedIn as well, I put videos every um, every day. So if you connect with me on LinkedIn, shoot me a connection. I'll get you the link to my newsletter, my videos, my wait list, all that. Just shoot me a DM and I'll get you that information. And then you can, you and I can maybe work together someday. Yeah. Fantastic. Listen, Ian, this has been superb. Thank you so much for all the insights. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you, John.